Executive Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer at Henry Ford Health System. As CSO of Henry Ford Health System, she provides executive counsel, leadership, uh, and um, for our strategic planning and partnership ventures, business development and transformation initiatives, government affairs, and also Henry Ford Innovations. That is the health system's multidisciplinary team responsible for product design and commercialization, including transfer licensing agreements and international programs. Carla Denise is an accomplished healthcare executive with nearly three decades of healthcare, nonprofit, and government experience. Prior to Henry Ford, she was executive vice president and chief strategy officer for Providence St. Joseph Health, and she was also chief administrative officer for their population health division and Chief Strategy Officer for Alameda Health System. In addition to all of her professional experience in healthcare, Carla Denise is, also has a PhD in medical sociology and a background in epidemiology. Rooted in a strong commitment to service, she, Dr. Edwards serves on multiple boards, including the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing and Haluna Health. Go nurses. We also have Bridget Hurd who is the Vice President of Inclu Inclusion and Diversity and Chief Diversity Officer at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, where she is responsible for leading and executing the corporate inclusion and diversity strategy and shaping a Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan culture of inclusion. She also leads the Office of Health and Health Disparities, which, in, um, which focuses on achieving health equity and the delivery of and access to care. Serving Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan and its subsidiaries, Ms. Hurd facilitates the Diversity Leadership Council and oversees diversity and cultural comp competency learning opportunities for employees and 15 employee resource networks. She currently represents Blue Cross Blue Shield um, on a coronavirus task force on racial disparities appointed by Governor Gretchen Whitmer on April 2020. She is the recipient of the DentaQuest 2020 Health Equity Heroes Award and recognizes individuals working to achieve equity during this time of coronavirus and recently was recognized at the, as the Executive of the Year by the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan Chapter of Leadership De Development Association. So thanks for joining us, Bridget. She will be uh, virtual today on the screen. And last but not least, I have our own Trina Sideros with us from uh, PwC's Health Research Institute. She leads our HRI group, which produces thought leadership on pharmaceutical and life sciences companies, healthcare provider companies, payers, employers, and new entrants. Trina is also co-host of PwC's healthcare podcast, Next in Health, and I've had the honor um, of presenting with Trina on Next in Health. And I think Carla Denise and Bridget will be presenting with us soon as well. So we encourage you to tune in and listen in for that. Trina is a, a management consultant with PwC. She works with uh, PLS companies on vaccines, mRNA, and also infectious disease related therapeutics. She works with a team within PwC dedicated to vaccines and infectious disease. A formal, formal journal, journalist, Trina has 17 years of newsroom experience. She was a science and medical reporter at the Chicago Tribune, winning state and national awards for her work. Her work has been cited in books and scientific papers. So with that, I'm honored to uh, host this panel today and moderate for you. So I'm partial to statistics. I think Carla Denise is too. I've worked with her um, over the years. So we're going to kick this off with some statistics um, so that you can see a clear picture of why we are all here today to talk about this very important topic of health equity. Early in the pandemic, by June 2020, 31% of COVID cases and 40% of COVID deaths were among African-American Michigan residents. African-Americans make up 14% of Michigan's population. By December, 26% of deaths were African-American Michigan residents. The mortality rate was 221 per 100,000 people. White Michiganders' death rate was 112 per 100,000 at that same point in time, almost half. Latinx Michiganders and Native American Michiganders also had higher rates of cases. These statistics were published in July of this year in a report on health equity prepared by the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. These statistics illuminate a trend. 
while on the national stage. Minorities have suffered more in this pandemic than white Americans. They have been more likely to fall ill with COVID-19, be hospitalized with it, die from it, lose their jobs and businesses due to the economic calamity that ensued. Minorities are more likely to report increased mental health distress, depression, anxiety due to the crisis. Once the vaccines were rolled out, minorities were, especially early on, less likely to be vaccinated. Minority children also have been disproportionately affected. They have been more likely to fall ill with COVID and MIS-C, the inflammatory syndrome. They have been more likely to be hospitalized for both. They have disproportionately lost parents, grandparents, and loved ones. Their parents and other relatives have lost jobs and businesses. From 2019 to 2020, Hispanic Americans experienced a three-year drop in life expectancy. Black Americans saw a decrease of 2.9 years, and white uh, experienced the smallest decline of 1.2 years. These grim realities are not due to a surprising one-off event. These pandemic area, era health disparities are not a surprise given our nation's long-standing history of health disparities due to race and ethnicity. This morning, our panel is going to discuss these disparities and what is being done to, to address them by health and business communities. And uh, this is a justice issue. It's not just a justice issue, it's a business issue. So with that, let's get started. I'm gonna join Carla Denise down here. So Carla Denise, can you tell me how you feel like this has affected um, your business? Well, you actually depressed me listening to all those <laughs> statistics. I was just thinking about the fact that we need data to help us understand the patterns and then transitions of disease. But at the same time, we didn't actually learn anything new with COVID. We've known for a long time that those who are underserved, those who've been disadvantaged, those who are underrepresented, have worse health outcomes. Um, I've had the benefit and privilege of being with Henry Ford now for I think I hit 14 months. And um, some of my leaders and my teammates are here in the audience. Uh, Dr. Adnan Mankara and Dr. Mike Genord, who are both here, are the head or the leaders of our health equity pillar in our diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice plan. Our CEO, Wright Lasseter, charged us not only with looking at how can we intervene on diversity issues, equity issues, inclusion issues, but we adopted a plan for social justice. I think the disparities that we've experienced and that many people got the unfortunate opportunity to witness last year, because if you didn't know about them already, you know about them now, um, are not unique to COVID. So Henry Ford didn't necessarily have a unique experience with COVID, nor did it have a different experience from many of my colleagues across the nation and the globe who were experiencing the pandemic as well. We did some great stuff, though, I will say. One of the things that we were able to do as a result of the pandemic uh, coming to fruition the way that it did was mobilize. We actually mobilized people around a common enemy, and it was COVID. And what I get excited about is, could we do that again and again and again, just play and repeat? You know, this is a policy conference, and people want to know, what can we actually do to make change? One of the things I think we can do are take the silver linings and the lessons we learned during this pandemic and apply them and make them sticky or standard work. And that's coming together to solve a complex problem and doing it fast throwing sometimes rules and regulations out the window and doing what works because it's the right thing as opposed to it's the political thing. And so Henry Ford was a leader in that. We worked with the city, we worked with the state um, to come up with solutions, everything from using our mobile units to go out to communities that were hard to reach, to deliver vaccines, to do testing, um, to mobilizing with the city to ensure that we had ways in which we can address workforce shortages and supply shortages across the state. So it was a great time in terms of coming together, but it's been a difficult time, not just for Henry Ford, but I think for all of us who've been in this fight for the last, I don't even know how many, are we 18 months now, 19 mm -hmm. months? I'm in denial. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thank you, Carla Denise. So Bridget, um, if you could tell us a little bit about how this has played out at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. Can we see them? Where are you guys? Can, can you guys see them? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. Great. okay. Hello, Maybe we're on they're the big screen one. there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know, it, April, when the information started coming in about the disparities we were seeing about morbidity and mortality because of COVID, we also took that opportunity to reflect on that. This is not new. These disparities that we've seen among people of color, African Americans, Native Americans, Hispanic, Latino, even among people of disabilities and, and the LGBTQ plus community, what COVID did was shine the light on the disparities and put in place an urgency to now address that. So when we think and reflect on COVID, those are some of the things that, that came out of that. So for Blue Cross Blue Shield, we've also been providing leadership on this work around addressing health and health disparities for a number of years. We have in place what we call our Health Disparities Action Team, and that's stakeholders from across the company who are working together. We started looking at the data to understand the data and the story that that tells us. But in addition to that data, we knew that we had to understand the stories of real people. That brings it home for us when we were doing this kind of work. It helps us truly understand what the needs are. So when the numbers started coming out around COVID and the disparities that we were seeing, we immediately established a COVID-19 work stream that was focused on addressing health and healthcare disparities. In addition to, as a health plan, waiving the costs associated with COVID treatment, um, looking at ways that we can increase telehealth in our communities across the state. Also, there is the opportunity to address food insecurity in a very significant way by working with community partners. We knew that we also had to buff, miss, do some myth busting in our communities especially our African-American community, where there was a rumor that African-Americans could not get COVID. We knew that we had to get accurate, reliable information to community residents in as fast as we could. And we also knew that we need to work through trusted partners to be able to do that. So we developed flyers and a toolkit. We partnered with faith-based institutions in our communities. And we, we got that information into the hands of those reliable partners any way that we can. So taking those steps to inform and educate, to work with community partners, to provide funding for mobile, mobile testing units was key. Yeah. Because as we know that, there were some other disparities going on in terms of who had access to care. And in those early months, when we talked about going for testing, you know, you could not walk down your street and, and, and find a site for testing. You know, you would have to drive 35 minutes for some people to find a testing site. And if we know anything about what we call those drivers of health care outcomes or those social determinants of health, if transportation is a barrier, you are not going to be able to get to the testing that you need for COVID-19. And so we wanted to work with partners in the community to remove those barriers, to create awareness, and to create true understanding about COVID-19, who gets it, how you're going to be impacted, and what you need to do if you do get it. So that was our immediate reaction. Um, and we worked on this um, very steadfastly for months and months and months throughout that first year to make sure that we were playing a role again in getting reliable, accurate information to our members and our community residents. Thank you, Bridget. So um, I'd like to open up a little bit from the standpoint of, is there anything that surprised you, um, Carla Denise, uh, about how this played out during the pandemic? Um, I'm an epidemiologist, so I'm a scientist by training, so nothing actually surprised me. We had two um, historical events uh, that could have or should have helped us predict what we're experiencing right now, 100 years ago and then 100 years before that. There were global pandemics. And so the surprise to me has been um, our inability to use history and data to create solutions that prevent bad things from happening in the future. 
That's what's surprising to me. Like, we cannot figure out how to learn from the past to prevent things from happening in the future. So I'm actually hopeful. I'm actually very hopeful. I spent most of the time really hoping, and, and I'm a prayerful person, praying, that we could figure out how to take the lessons learned here and push them forward so that we can then deploy and implement changes that would be sustainable. One of the things that we learned is that our public health infrastructure is broken. Our public health infrastructure is broken. Most of us in here pay taxes, whether you own a house or you bought a car or even you buy gas and there's tax on gas. And when we pay those taxes, it enables us to have schools, roads, and what else? Fire departments. And we pay the firemen to sit around and wait for a fire, whether it comes to your house or not. We pay for the schools to exist, whether you send your kids there or not. Our public health infrastructure has not been sustained in a way that could thwart this pandemic, or future ones for that matter. So my hope is that we learned one thing. We need to invest in a public health infrastructure. We need to either have public-private partnerships where organizations like Henry Ford can serve as the intermediary and provide the services on behalf of the public, or we need to create them, right, and have them sustained and maintained. I think one of the things that's been incredibly phenomenal is the fact that you saw corporations coming together with the public sector, with nonprofits, to solve problems. Everything from supply chain, right, getting masks out, right, getting uh, equipment into the hospitals, and getting COVID tests out. If we could figure out how to come together for that, could we come together for something that would sustain this partnership so that we can preclude and prevent the next virus that enters our ecosystem from shutting the economy down? Because this is the beginning. So I don't know how many of you have read this great book. It's Thomas Friedman. Um, thank you for being late. And he talks about the speed of change over time. And it used to be that things change like this. Now with technology, change happens like this. And the same thing is happening with environmental concerns and the infiltration of viruses. Used to be a virus would come like this, now viruses are coming like this. We gotta get ahead of it. So what I learned is that we fail at learning from the past and applying it forward. What I'm hopeful for is that we'll figure out how to take some of the things we did this time to make it better, quicker, like getting vaccines on the shelf. Science and research has been done for decades on this vaccine, right? On SARS. And we got it out there. We did it fast. We need to play and repeat the next time this happens. So I'm hopeful we learned that. Thank you. Bridget, were there any surprises for you with the pandemic? No, definitely no sur surprises that um, I experienced when I reflect on um, last year in particular. Again, when we talk about access issues and who has this access and who does not have access, I also would like to reflect on the lessons learned and especially around the policy. Because early in the pandemic, let's say April, when many of us were still trying to figure this out and really understand what um, some of the issues are, whether we need to wear masks or don't wear masks. And if we look into our inner city communities in particular, and we think about individuals who are working class members of our society. And so what I'm going towards is the necessity for when we rethink public health, when we rethink policy, is that we rethink how we rethink it. Yeah. And what I mean is, when we think about individuals and working class families, those of us in our, this room, we were privileged to be able to stay home, work at home, in our home offices, remotely using our laptop. But working class individuals were getting up each and every single day getting dressed, getting out, and going to a job where they came in contact with the public. And when they did that, when they got up and got dressed and got out, many of them were using public transportation. Mm -hmm. And we've seen the stories in the media. There was one that just touches me every time I reflect on it, 
of a bus driver who talks about how the individuals are coming on the bus and they were coughing and the germs were just swelling. And then one week later, he was dead from COVID. And so when we think about policy and implementing new policy, it's taking the opportunity to make sure that we're not just reflecting on the privilege in, of those of us in society, that we're just not using our own frame of reference to develop policy, but we're taking the opportunity to consider everyone. That at the start of the process, we're asking those questions that will help us understand how, you know, the working class, how will they be affected or benefit from this policy? People with disabilities, and the list goes on. And so when I think about lessons learned, and again, reflecting on the testing sites, you know, are we going where people are most vulnerable in providing that access? Are we immediately thinking about what those needs are? And so those are the opportunities to go forward. And if we all reflect back on 2020, we know in the first six months, that wasn't the reality. That was not the reflection that we had. We didn't ask those questions. And so that's the opportunity we have moving forward. Thank you, Bridget. Trina, were there any surprises from your perspective? Uh, no, I, I, I concur with, uh, with Bridget and Carla Denise. If you look at the history of, of outbreaks and pandemics, it, they almost always kind of run the same. Um, you look at even the Black Death, uh, you know, that bears a lot of resemblance, amazingly so, to what we are all experiencing. You look at the cholera outbreaks of the 19th century in the United States, Similar, similar, similar to what we're experiencing, the 1918, 1919 uh, influenza pandemic, very similar. So I think that if you look at the history of how these kinds of crises play out, um, what we all experience, the, the disproportionate impact on, um, on minorities, on, on people with fewer resources, that all plays out just time after time. And so I think that this... Um, this is a time when we have an opportunity to do something like what happened out of the cholera outbreaks, where we had the birth of the sort of modern um, United States public health infrastructure, the public health departments. Do we have a chance to remake our public health infrastructure in a way that's far more inclusive and attentive to all of us, um, rather than what we have had that sort of led to what we see today and all the statistics that you shared um, at the beginning of this panel. I think we do, and I think there's a lot of funding that is gonna go into it, into preparing us for the next pandemic. I think there's a lot of federal funding, state funding, a lot of policy making that's going to happen. And so if we can do that with an eye toward what happened this time, all the disproportionate impact and preventing that as one of our priorities, I think we will be better prepared and we may not see what we had this time around again um, next time we have a pandemic, which likely we will. So I think um, I just concur with, with Carla, Denise, and Bridget that, that nothing surprised me, um, but that we have a chance this time to do it differently, and that there is precedent for, doing, for building infrastructures in the past that have helped us um, along the way, and we can do it better this time around, I think. Could I just jump in? I, th Please. I thought what she said was so important about the policy. The only way the policy will happen is if we actually can do two things. One, care. People have to actually care that more black and brown people died. I mean, you can't legislate that. So you need to care. And I think the people who do care, as small as you might feel, your N of one is so incredibly important. So we need to advocate for the changes that we need. The second, for those who don't care, we need to build a business case. So those who don't actually care that brown and black people died might care about money. So we need to build the business case. It was a question that was asked of the last panel, and I really appreciated the panelists' answer, um, because I do believe that we should do it because it's the right thing to do, but I also know a whole bunch of people who don't do things because they're the right thing to do. And so we need to show them the dollars and cents. And it is not in our economic best interest as in a global economy to have a majority of us unable to be productive citizens in the work world. 
It's just not. I read the statistics. I did a panel. Um, it was early on in the pandemic, pandemic with Ernst and Young. Sorry, your competitor. They asked me to speak. Um, <laughs> yeah, all good. All good. And it was on the business case for health equity. Right, so I'm doing my homework and my research, and there were a couple of data points that stood out for me that I shared during that panel. One of them was that in Q1 of 2020, only 4% of the Fortune 500 companies on the S&P mentioned diversity or equity in their earnings calls. Mm -hmm. Q1 of 2020, so that's January, February, March. In Q2 of 2020, 40% of the calls had a conversation about diversity and equity. Why? Because guess what? They were feeling the pain of people not showing up to work, feeling the pain of people dying, feeling the pain of trying to figure out how to get COVID tests disseminated and the cost associated with that. So right there is an example of how the pandemic changed the conversation on earnings calls. So now how do we then take that forward? Another really interesting data point is about $82 billion. I think that's the right number. Yeah, because it's $60 billion in cost associated with healthcare that's unnecessarily uh, distributed, and then about $22 billion in loss of pro productivity. So there's about $82 billion cost to administering healthcare in the country that results in poor outcomes. So we spend money and we still don't get the outcomes that we need for people to be productive. If you move that forward to the year 2050, it's gonna grow to $353 billion in cost for businesses to administer healthcare programs that still don't get them the outcomes that they need for their businesses to be productive and competitive in the global economy. And so part of me wants to say, just care, just be a human and care that a fellow human is suffering. But if you don't care, care about the money. It costs the United States a lot of money to administer healthcare services, still not get the health outcomes because we're at the bottom of all the rankings globally. And Michigan's not doing too great either nationally, right? And we can't compete. So I just say, Trina, I really appreciate what you said about the policy. We need the policy change, but it's only going to happen if one of two things happen. We care enough to make a noise, make a stink, or we care enough about the financial implications of not doing anything so that we can get something done. Well said, well said. Um, so to piggyback on that, this has been going on for centuries, right? Um, back to the earliest days of the nation with slavery. And it's tempting for people, like you were just talking about, to wring their hands or say, you know, I want to help, but wh what are we going to really do to make a, a difference? What you were just talking about, it's, you know, let's just not talk about it. You know, what are we gonna do to make concrete start changes? How do we start? Where do we start? Will my actions really make a difference? So Carla Denise, can you talk a little bit about that? So I'm a storyteller, I always have a story. Every speech I have a kid's story, so I got a kid's story. So when I first um, finished my PhD at the University of Florida, I became a presidential management intern. We're still allowed to call them interns back then because it was pre-Monica Lewinsky. And um, I had an assignment. My assignment was to look at the implications of disparities right, on the Medicare program. And I found three ways in which the government was overspending as a result of disparities. One was in the inequitable distribution of mental health drugs and treatment for substance abuse. And at that time, the Supreme Court had already opined that people who had mental health concerns and substance abuse concerns should get equitable treatment by Medicare, the Olmstead decision. The other one was around neonates and children being born. Women of color, poor women, women born in, uh, children born in urban and rural areas had poor health outcomes, right, than those who had means. And then the third was in aging, right? Our seniors, particularly those people of color, were not able to access care that would enable them to live well. Not long, 
but well. And so I had the benefit, the privilege of coming up with some solutions. And so one of the things I had the awesome opportunity to do was to help write rules and regulations associated with laws that had been passed. So I moved from DC to Florida and was part of a team that wrote the regulation for the hearing loss bill. So every newborn born in the state of Florida, and you have it here in Michigan, had to be screened for hearing loss, right? So I got to write this rule, helped write the regulation. That was in 2001. In 2003, my son was born, and he was screened at birth for hearing loss. Didn't think anything about it, because I was like excited, though, because I was like, oh, my kid gets to get pricked. You know, like, I wrote the rule that. And my son ended up having severe, profound hearing loss. And I share that with you, because that little rule that seems so inconsequential has changed the trajectory of about 163 per thousand brown babies across the United States. Mm. What we found was boys, black boys in school, who were perceived as disciplinary problems, one in five had a hearing deficiency. Mm. So a policy that was put in place by a little intern called Carla Denise actually paid, paid forward to me personally. So that's why I think it is not inconsequential for every single human being in this room to make a difference. And we often say the problem's too big. Oh, it's too big. You can make a difference. Every single one of you could do one thing that made a difference in somebody else's life, even if it's smiling at somebody in an elevator or on the street who could be having the worst day of their life. So I believe that policies make difference. I believe that you have a passion for what's important to you and that you can actually change that N of one to be an N of a thousand just by speaking up. Well, that's a hard one to follow. That was fabulous, Carla Denise. Um, got a tearing up here. Um, Bridget, uh, what would, you, what would you have to say about you know, some of the changes that have worked for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan? Yeah, well, I, I can't go without speaking and, and talking about inclusion, about inclusion and diversity. And it truly builds on that, that concept of just caring. And um, what you care about is up to you. Yeah. I think so often there is this huge misconception when you use the words diversity or inclusion. And so often pe people think that diversity just means, oh, stuff for people of color. <laughs> but diversity is stuff for everyone in our community, in our workplaces, in, in this nation, in this world. And the opportunity is there for us to really embrace that. And I've been leading our IND efforts, as we call it, for um, almost six years now. And probably around year two, I really began to understand what the true definition of diversity and inclusion. And diversity plus inclusion equals empathy and compassion. Absolutely. And empathy is that opportunity to be able to listen without judgment to another person, understand their story, not what you see on the outside and those things you make assumptions about based on stereotypes that you've received from so many different places but that opportunity to understand them and understand their condition. And then the compassion comes in when you take that opportunity to think about how you, as one person, can make a difference, Absolutely. how you can adapt, how you can change policy that would meet the specific needs of different communities. And again, you know, following right behind Carla and Denise, that is where the opportunity is yeah. for all of us to make that kind of difference. Because when we start caring and we start asking the right questions in the right way at the right time, we're going to be able to make some changes around those drivers of health care and the health outcomes that we see. You absolutely can. Yep, absolutely, Bridget. Trina, what about at PwC? Some things you've seen? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think I can give a good example of a, of a, how a policy can break in a way that's unexpected, and that rethinking it um, is important, or at least looking at the impact of it. So, so um, a few months ago, uh, there was when we were rolling out the vaccine um, in this country, and there was a lot of um, there was a whole you know long lines. I, I think we all remember you know this sort of crush of how do you, how do you get an appointment, how do you get a vaccine. Um, and all of that. Now, now we're begging people to to get the vaccine. But back then, this is at the time when there was a crush, and so the Biden administration made a policy that said we're going to roll it out to retail pharmacies, and so we're going to have pharmacies, these bricks and mortar pharmacies, be sort of a, another place where you can get a vaccination that will greatly expand um, the places people can go. And so on the face of it, this sounds like a fantastic idea that will greatly expand access to the vaccine. But if you look and you map out where retail pharmacies are located, it exacerbates the issue because they are disproportionately located in affluent communities and suburbs around white Americans. And so that policy because it breaks toward uh, the folks that were already getting the vaccine, really um, you have to question what the impact is and whether it's gonna solve the problem that it's trying to solve. And so I think thinking these kinds of policies through, and, and I will say, I'm not just picking on that one policy, it, it served a purpose too, but in terms of expanding access for um, people of color, for for populations that were not getting the vaccine, maybe there are other things that needed to be done that were more important. So I think this is the way that policy has to be looked at. Like, what is the, the goal? And is it exacerbating a problem? Is it solving a problem? It sounds good on the face of it, but when you map things out, you know, does it really um, land where you think it's gonna land? And I think that's sort of piece by piece, taking that lens on every policy we make around health, um, can really greatly, greatly improve what we're doing. Um, so for me at HRI, at the Health Research Institute, I, I led our regulatory center and we were looking at policies, all kinds of policies, mostly coming out of the federal government, some state policies. And if you take, you know, sort of the enormous, like, a flood of policy that comes out every single day out of CMS and, and um, you know, the, the and FDA and so on, and you start putting that lens on the policies, you, know, you come out with, with um, a lot of improvements that can be made and on a grand scale that can really move the needle. So, um, so that's, that's what I would say on policy. If you take that lens, there can be changes that are made that in aggregate can really change the lives of a lot of folks. Yeah, and I'd like to drill in on that a little bit. I work a lot in the virtual health space and one of the things we've seen um, is that uh, virtual healthcare, ha whether with the policy, re there were relaxations for those of you that don't work as much in healthcare, and um, you were able to do um, visits on the phone. There was um, reimbursement parity for that. There were providers were allowed to provide care across state lines. So in some cases, you know, as, as uh, physicians that work with you, in the past, if they were only licensed in Michigan, they could only provide care in Michigan. There was a relaxation. You could provide care across um, the US, um, not based on your licensure. And it really opened up the doors. And we saw a lot of um, social deter deter determinants of health um, uh, really um, benefit from this from the standpoint of you, know, you could call on the phone. You could have um, a do not show rate. One of the things we track in healthcare is called do not show. And um, a, a lot of minorities. Um, have issues with that, greater issues, because what Bridget was talking about with transportation or um, being able to get off of work, like Carla Danius was talking about. So really making sure that um, people can get the health care they need. Sometimes, um, especially in behavioral health, um, there was no reason why not to do, uh, you're not often having to touch someone when you're having behavioral health care. So um, if you're able to do that on the phone or via an iPad, I know there are a lot of grants um, I was work. I was uh, actually riding to um, to the uh, stables last night with someone was saying they were giving out uh, iPads, um, you know, a remote patient monitoring even for conditions um, outside of behavioral health. This has really helped keep people connected, and we've seen emergency department use go down, urgent care, what have you.
because people are getting care when they need it, how they need it, in the way they want um, to receive it. So it's been an exciting time um, in, in this world, particularly, I think, for a lot of healthcare leaders. Well, Michigan can be a leader. Michigan was a leader in a lot of ways during the pandemic, which was one of the reasons I was so excited to move my family here last year just watching from the sidelines the leadership that came from Blue Cross, that came from Wright Lasseter at Henry Ford, that came from the mayor in Detroit and the governor. I mean, I know our governor took a lot of hits, but she stood up. She stood up with conviction, and she was strong around masks, around testing, around social distancing, and managing what was really some complex issues with school and economics. And so I say all that because we have led in the past we can continue to be a leader by ensuring the parity that's required for access to remote or virtual care and payment continues beyond the pandemic. We can be a leader in requiring patient-reported outcome measures to be a part of what hospitals report, not just inpatient bed utilization. Are we actually doing treatment that helps people feel better and have a better quality of life? which is a patient's reported outcome, versus we're only reporting if the physician followed the protocol or got the outcome that the physician thought they should receive. So there are so many opportunities for us to show up as leaders in this space that continue to put the patients and the families at the center of care um, in terms of how we report data and information, in terms of how we pay and reimburse for particular services, in a way that enables parity for mental health concerns, substance abuse concerns, and somatic health concerns for virtual care versus in-person care. So I'm actually really excited because I know the people in this room, the people that I work with, um, are adamant about getting that parity, adamant about innovation and technology being the forefront of the state and how we turn this economy around um, so that the next virus that infiltrates our system doesn't have to shut us down. We'll be prepared. Absolutely, absolutely. So one of the things our HRI Institute recently studied was around ESG, so um, environmental, social, and governance issues. And um, you know, right now in C-suites, um, there's a lot of meetings going around uh, the globe on this. And we also looked and we saw that a lot of um, organizations were talking about diversity, inclusion, health equity, social justice. Um, what do you think are some of the most um, concrete actions going around ESG or, um, or some of these more just PR uh, announcements? It's a lot of PR. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I probably shouldn't say this publicly, but if I look on LinkedIn one more time and I see another black person taking a diversity job, I'm going to scream. <laughs> I believe that women and people of color can do more than be your chief diversity officer. We're scientists, we're teachers, we're economists, we're lawyers, <laughs> we're all these things. And then I've had more friends leave their jobs as a business professional to get a SVP title as a chief diversity officer. I'm like, you didn't study that in school. It's actually a discipline. Mm -hmm. You studied business at Wharton. What are you doing? So I'm sorry I digressed a no, little bit. And perfect. I don't know how that happened. Spot on. I don't know how that happened. But I do believe that ESGs and a lot of this stuff is lip service. I will say this, though. I'm so proud to work for an organization that is absolutely committed to having a strategy around diversity, which means that we are going to work our tails off to make sure that we have equity among the people who work for us in terms of their roles, their opportunities, and their pay. Mm. I'm very proud of the fact that we have an inclusion plan and a social justice plan. We're, we're going to work around the edges of what we're accountable for and try to address things like police brutality, and mental health care in schools. 
right? And I'm very proud of our health equity strategy, which is to address the very fundamental root cause of many of the disparities, which starts with mom and baby, yep. right? And to be number one with our partner, MSU, on health equity research and collaboration. And so I do believe there's a lot of lip service out there. I'm really disappointed in the number of people who have jumped ship to become the chief diversity officer. She called me three times to do this panel. I told her no three times. And then my marketing people said, no, you have to do it. <laughs> so I'm tired. I want us to be who we grew up to be, right? And that will only happen if we stop doing lip service and you give people of color a chance. And so you give them a chance by giving them the job that they studied in school, which is pharmacy, auto, auto mechanics, technology, whatever it is. But very few of us actually studied diversity. We just know it because we're black. And we know it, unfortunately, through the School of Hard Knocks. But I know there's a lot of women in here who've had to deal with that glass ceiling, right? And there are a lot of folks, I heard the reference to the disabled this morning. I just think the only way, Claudia, to get around this is for us to actually do what we say, which is create a plan, create a strategy, live into the plan, and hold yourself accountable for the outcomes. And you can only do that if you tell people what it is. So many of the companies have done a good job of telling people what it is. Now our job is to hold them accountable for it. Look at what they said in those earnings calls about what they were going to do and ask them if they actually did it. Yep. That's yep. part of what we have to do. Absolutely, absolutely. Bridget? Yes, well, Carla Denise, you give me a lot to respond to. I don't even know. <laughs> You can disagree with me too, girl. I'm okay. You can disagree. <laughs> of inclusion and diversity, one, I feel privileged. And um, I'm not in this world because I'm black. I'm in this world because I'm good. I'm just going to put it out there like that. And I'm good at casting a vision, helping people to come to greater understanding Absolutely. about what exactly diversity means. Because we assume we know what that means, but we really don't what inclusion looks like and feels like. When I look in my organization, that is my role, that is my person, my purpose to expand the consciousness of all human beings walking around our, our, our buildings. And also to build that cultural competency where we're setting the foundation for greater understanding about how do we serve one another? And most importantly, or even as important, how do we serve our members? How do we step back and prepare ourselves to be able to ask the question, whether it's at the start of a marketing campaign, where we're Absolutely. developing new insurance products, when we're thinking about legal stuff, you know, when we're taking that opportunity across the organization. Uh, Trina and I were talking earlier, when we have that baked into the constitution of who we are, that's what the real work is. My work is actually not part of the human resources function. My not. work is about building a culture. It's about change management. It's that opportunity to engage, ignite, and renew. And that's why I am passionate about the opportunity to address equity, to address equality, because we sometimes forget about that, increase understanding of diversity. And diversity is each and every person sitting in this room and what we bring. And a part of that is understanding diversity representation. Inclusion is recognizing our differences and our similarities and embracing and respecting those things. And cultural competency is our ability to see the person standing in front of us and interact with them in a way that's most meaningful in where they are. And I'm gonna bring it back to healthcare. And when we think about healthcare, that's exactly what we need to do. We need to understand who we're serving, what their needs are, how can we meet them where they are. And when I think about our health equity work that we've been doing, um, in December, we formally established our Office of Health and Healthcare Disparities. I'm very deliberate about words, and because there is a distinct difference between a health disparity and a health care disparity, yes. and understanding that definition is key because it's going to inform how you ask questions, what you're solving for, what solutions you put on the table, 
when you understand the differences between a health disparity and a health care disparity. Mm -hmm. And we are looking at this from both a systemic approach as well as doing the programs that we put into the community, how we provide information. And when we think about policy, it's that opportunity to think about it from that systemic perspective. And we want to lay the foundation based on the data. We know when we talk about healthcare data that there's so many different sources. They're all not complete sources, but you have to start. I always say, don't use a lack of data as a reason not to get moving. And so um, that is why um, this work is so important. And in terms of what other organizations are doing, I think some people, some organizations are 100% behind it and they're well ready to move. They're really ready to listen to their employees and really understand. And that's the key. We make assumptions that, you know, my white coworker understands my struggle as a black woman. Guess what? They really don't. And so the opportunity is there to, to share and, and tell those stories. And then, I mean, I understand my white coworkers' experience as a white woman. Yeah. And so that's where the learning is and the, where the aha moments. When I reflect on 2020, we did a lot of listening sessions. And the feedback that I received from employees is that those sessions were healing. That's a big word, that they were healing and that they were so proud of the fact that Blue Cross was providing these sessions so we can talk to one another, share our stories. And the stories that I heard were just amazing from all kinds of people. And it's when we're sharing those stories and understanding that, you know, 24-year-old um, men, you know, driving around, making a decision, do I wear a cap or wear, don't wear a cap? This is real stuff. And this is, these are things that are happening to coworkers that you sit next to or walk by in the hallway. That's the opportunity to expand consciousness and real understanding. It's not just what we see on the news. It is what our friends, our coworkers experience every day. So that's why I'm passionate about the work that I do. I didn't study diversity and inclusion when I was offered this opportunity six years ago. Uh, I said, let me go home and think about this. Um, Avant-garde. But I realized that when I think about the purpose and the purpose to help people become their better selves, that's what I'm able to accomplish in this role. And so I do hope that there are other individuals in this type of role and other organizations that have their foot on the pedal and they're moving fast forward. So thank you. Thank <laughs> I need to respond that. to all of that. <laughs> thank you. And I do want to add one more thing too, that for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, we have been on this inclusion and diversity journey for 15 years through the vision of our president and CEO, Daniel J. Love. So this is not new stuff for us. This is not new territory. We saw the importance of this many, 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 many years ago. And it's about uplifting everyone in our organization and being able to provide the best in customer service for our members. Yeah. Absolutely. This Fabulous. A leader. So we have a few minutes for questions. Um, thank you for that, Bridget and Carla Denise and Trina. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, I see one in the back. Go ahead. You still interested? You still have a question? Oh, OK, OK, no worries, no worries. Any questions? If not, maybe while you're thinking about it, Trina, oh, OK. Thank you. Um, the Governor's Racial Disparities Task Force, and, and, and hello to all of us that have uh, been privileged to be in that space, has identified that one of the critical areas that we begin to look at is how we, in fact, fund health care. Uh, because those funding decisions drive policy uh, probably more so than all of our talking. Um, and so one of the things that's been discussed about with access is having more clinics uh, not only in terms of FQHCs, but also mobile clinics, whether they come out of uh, health plans and hospitals, really being throughout the community. And I'm wondering how, both from the 
uh, perspective as a hospital system and as a insurer, how are you looking at and perhaps proposing uh, that how are we going to increase funding in the areas of prevention and to your point, early intervention so that we can in fact have more parity and address the underlying causes of poor health outcomes. Could you talk about that funding dynamic from your perspectives, please? Sure, do you wanna go first, Carla? Oh, Bridget. Bridget? Oh, sure, definitely. I think what's fundamental too is really taking the opportunity to uplift those health-focused community organizations. How do we use them to leverage, to go into the community and build that trust? Because trust is a huge factor. So if we can provide some support, policy support, funding support for some of these agencies, I think that makes a huge difference. I also reflect on the role of community health workers. This is something you don't hear about very much or very often anymore. How do we leverage and fund community health workers? I specifically do not have any recommendations for that, but know that it is indeed something we need to focus on. And um, I just think two years ago from the stories I've heard of, um, how nurses would go out in the community um, in the late 70s and early 80s and visit households and be that resource for families in terms of their well care and their well being. If we can find a way to make that kind of investment in people again, I think it would make a difference in terms of individual health outcomes, what we see as a society, and then that economic piece that we were talking about earlier. Yep. Well, I heard two things in your question, and maybe because one of my passions is the study of healthcare economics, and so I always think about this at a macro level, and we absolutely as a nation have to figure out how to change um, the way in which healthcare is financed and funded in the country. And it has to be consider consistent with the geopolitics of capitalism in our democracy. I don't believe we can go to one extreme or the other. We have to find that middle ground that creates the value proposition associated with people being healthy, with people being well. We have to figure out how to make money off of people being healthy and people being well. We live in a capitalist society, people like to make money, and let's make money off of people being well instead of people being sick. So that's one. Mm -hmm. The second, in terms of funding, I think about the panel that preceded us and they talked about the difference between implementing programs and implementing policy. We can do program after program after program, but those are not policies that fundamentally change the way in which people get access to care and how it's paid for and financed. And so I do believe we need more clinics. We need more access points. We need more access points. We need more affordable access points. And they could be clinics, they could be mobile units, they could be hospitals for all that matters, but it has to be affordable to the insurer, the person who's paying the bill, to the employer, the person who's paying the bill, to the individual, the person who's paying the bill. The reason it's so complex is because we got so many people paying the bill. We gotta figure out a way to simplify that. Where does the value actually accrue when somebody's healthy or well? It should accrue to all of us, even those who are running health systems and hospitals that are on the ready when a national or global health crisis occurs. And for whatever reason, we don't feel like we should pay for hospitals and health systems to be on the ready. And that has to be part of the solution that we put in place at a policy level, because otherwise we can't afford to sustain what we've just experienced over the last two years. Hmm. Well said. Um, Trina? Do we have any more? Oh, go ahead. Good morning, thank you. Um, you were talking about these layers and I, I serve veterans in the state of Michigan. We have over 567,000 veterans in this state, making us the 11th largest state in the country. And you know, I think about some of the racial disparities. We have a large um, uh, uh, minority veteran population in the state as well. And, and some of those mental health disparities that they're dealing with on top of the fact that maybe they don't qualify for VA health care because they were maybe disproportionately discharged at a general dishonorable discharge from the military. 
what type of policies are you all implementing to be able to serve those types of uh, populations on a diversity scale? Yeah. So I'm new to Michigan, so you just taught me something, and I can't wait to meet you and talk to you further about it, because it's such an important issue and one that touches me deeply as a military brat. My father served in the US Marine Corps. My brother went to the US Naval Academy, and both of them suffered uh, with mental health and post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so I don't know the answer to your question around what Michigan is doing, but I will absolutely do some homework on it. But I think one of the things that we absolutely need to do is if anybody gets health care at all and gets access to mental health services, it's our troops and their families. It's, it's unfathomable that people will go across the seas to protect our freedom. Our freedom to argue over whether or not to wear a mask. Mm. Our freedom to not get vaccinated. And then they come home and they can't get something as basic as a counseling appointment. So I want to find you, sister girl. The light's in my eyes. <laughs> but it's fine me, because you know we can do something. I like to make stuff happen. So let's do something, because that's so important. Someone in the audience might know the answer, but I don't know the answer to that question. Bridget, do you have thoughts on that? No, I don't have any additional thoughts. OK. I think, are we at, at our time? We're about there. I think we're pretty yep. close. Yeah, we're getting the signal from we're the We're getting the signal. So thank you all. <laughs> um, we'll be around afterwards if you have questions, but thank you for coming today. Thank you. All right, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please make your way to the theater. The next sessions begin at 11.45 a.m.